and welcome to lesson number seven, which has the title The Material Body and the Mechanical Body. So this lesson will discuss how Freud proposes the notion of archetypes after psychoanalysis. Psychologists study aesthetics as a scientific problem related to empathy. Fischer and Lips propose empathy as a result of emotional bonding. Fischer proposes that empathy occurs as the human body engages with objects which arouse feelings of similarity, seeing the subject who experiences empathy as mirroring himself in the perceived objects. Wolflin proposes the psychology of architecture questioning. How is it that architecture forms are able to express an emotion or mood? Henri van der Velde related empathy to the total artwork, the Gesamtkunstwerk. Birth of phenomenology and Taylorism takes place. The focus shifts from the theme park to the assembly line. So in this lesson, we will bring back this discussion. We started a few lessons ago. Uh, you remember when we spoke about Charcot and the Salpetriere and how um, in the 19th century these experiments were being done to already try to understand uh, the workings of the mind and the, the workings of the brain and how this was connected to the body and also with uh, behavioral sciences. Uh, this lesson will address exactly the theories of the theory of empathy and how the birth of psychology um, influenced also uh, questions of aesthetics and therefore uh, architecture. So an extremely important factor regarding the end of the 19th century is the influence of psychology and evolutionary theory, which offered alternatives to the open questions of metaphysics and especially the growing awareness of the notions of the conscious, the unconscious and archetypes. The concept of archetype, especially its connection to psychoanalysis and Freud, was particularly interesting for architecture as it allowed the creation of a symbolic system of categorization of architecture both in terms of spatial organization and of building elements, particularly through the use of architectural or spatial metaphors to describe emotional states and vice versa. So the question of style would also bring along the notion of type and its relation to canon and what this represents in terms of symbolic meaning. Now you might feel a little bit confused. Why are we going back and forth with the 19th century? But of course, the reason for this lies in the necessity to explain this very complex context in which um, this new theory of aesthetics would appear, the empathy theory. So this empathy theory, which in German is called Einfühlung, um, has been um, documented re re and rediscovered by Harry Francis Malgrave, who I also mentioned before. Uh, in the previous lessons, uh, Professor Malgrave has a lifelong interest in the questions of uh, German aesthetics and so much of this uh, discussion now uh, that, that I will bring up to the video uh, is based also on, on his work. Uh, so besides making a vast collection on the topic of emotions and empathy in architecture, Mulgrave states uh, that it was necessary to wait until the development and use of brain scanning technologies in the areas of cognitive and neurosciences at the end of the 20th century to bring these topics back into architectural discussion because the topic of empathy, uh, as we saw before with the, and also with the, with the aesthetic theories of Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, for example, um, these discussions were all, were, had already happened uh, but they did not have a scientific basis. Descartes also tried uh, to establish a, a scientific basis uh, to the question of, of perception and to the, to the question to also to understand how the brain perceives uh, forms and how the, and how the human body uh, perceives and, and uh, is affected by external uh, stimuli. But it was really, in the 19th century with, with empathy uh, theory that the first seeds of a scientific basis to understand this process um, started. So the theoretical foundations of this kind of research um, start exactly with the Einfühlung theory, with the empathy theory, directly uh, how it uh, developed questions of aesthetics, 
uh, related to the emotional experience of art and most specifically how it uh, influenced the architectural discussions of the beginnings of the 20th century. So the first steps towards the foundation of a theory of empathy were taken by the German Friedrich Wiescher, who was largely influenced by Gottfried Semper. Both were refugees in Zurich by 1866. Already in 1851, Wiescher had started to address the problem of symbolic art regarding architecture, having classified the task of the architect as the one who manipulates matter by infusing it with life through the linear and planar suspension of its parts. Thanks to Semper's influence, Wiescher started to approach the problem through a physiological basis that justified the tendency of the brain to connect emotionally and symbolically with art forms. He risked asserting that probably there were neurological modifications happening inside the brain as a result of the body's exposure to certain objects that had a specific resonance in the sensory system. These would allow the brain to create a particular symbolic representation or an image that represented the emotional moods of the viewer. According to Malgrave, Wiescher further notices that vertical lines elevate the human spirit, horizontal lines broaden it, curves move more energetically than straight lines, and the brain has an impulse to fashion the symbolic and emotional reconfiguration of the world as a unifying and contractive feeling, that is, as the pantheistic or animistic urge to read our emotions and ourselves in the forms of the sensuous world. This was still a first theory on the subject, and it would be Wiescher's son, Robert, to follow in his father's steps and coin the concept of Einfühlung, or empathy, as an in-feeling or feeling into, which actually doesn't have a perfect equivalent in the English language. It's really a German concept. More than just an emotional bond between the viewer and the object he perceives, it is rather a reading of these objects through collective, cultural and con context-related, and personal experiences. Wiesche was also highly influenced by Freud's archetypes and the idea that while we dream, our subconscious produces metaphorical or symbolic allusions to our body, for instance, represented through images of a house as a projection of our corporeality, meaning organism and soul, into the form of the conceived object. Still, Wiescher wanted to prove that his theory had a physiological and neurological basis, and here he adds the concept of similarity as the harmony between object and subject instead of a property in the object itself. So, importantly enough, Wiescher here states that this kind of uh, reciprocity or this, this kind of uh, connection between the perceiver and the perceived object can only have does not happen because of something that the object has but it happens because of the capacity of the perceiver to actively detect properties in the object that resonate with with her or himself so Visha went further, stating that we relate objects to our bodily form, but also that objects themselves might present certain features that excite our muscles, nerves or visual apparatus. In a more complex level, if we understand these small perceptions as a whole, or feelings, we can relate them to certain psychological responses and conclude that our empathic relationship with an object is physiognomic by relating to its appearance or emotional. Malgrave adds to Vicious definition that we have a physiognomic understanding of the world because we have bodies and this relationship empire inspires empathy when we read our emotions and personalities into the objects of the world and the key to our experience in art 
lies in our ability to use our imagination, which means our ability to transport ourselves into the objects, dedicating to them our vital energy. Visha goes on giving examples for the expansive feeling or contractive feeling that one can feel while looking at a large object, for example, a cathedral in the first case, or a small shell in the second case, which makes us transport the feeling of our own bodily features into the scales, into the scale or properties of the object. So, for example, Victor, Victor Hugo also wrote a very interesting uh, text, Notre Dame du Haut, where, where he talks about Quasimodo and how Quasimodo um, lives in Notre Dame in this very small room and how this small room uh, is uh, wonderfully ad adapted to his body and uh, you know, uh, Quasimodo, of course, in the story. Um, he's, uh, he, he has a very strong hunch, so he has this uh, physical, physical problem, but it's uh, poetically beautifully described how he feels li like a snail uh, in his shell and how the building uh, fits, uh, fits his body and gives him his uh, sense of home and where he transports his own sense. So regarding the question of harmony, Vichy works over the Kantian notion of purposiveness, adding that harmony does not result from certain mathematical proportions as attributes to the objects themselves, but from our own body, bodily or mental disposition to engage with certain objects due to the feelings they produce in us. The same could be applied for feelings of harmony and balance or also by an object characterized by its complexity as long as it arouses in the body neurological associations which trigger something in his equally complex neurological constitution or in which the viewer can mirror characteristics of himself as strengthening or weakening of the general vital sensation. So we continue now with the beginnings of the Einfühlung theory and so we advance to 1886 and to Wolfram's proposal of a psychology of architecture. Wolfram was an art historian who developed a doctoral thesis based on the question, how is it that architectural forms are able to express an emotion or mood? A question which is also asked with this discussion of Architekturgeschichte. Um, how is it that architectural forms are able to induce an emotion or a mood in our bodies? How, how does it happen? The answer might lie exactly in this idea of empathy and the properties of what we now know from, from neuroscience, what are called mirror neurons, and the reciprocal relationship or transference that occurs between a subject, a viewer, a perceiver, and an object. On the contrary of Vischer, who emphasized the role of imagination in such a process, Wolfram concentrated his focus on the concept of expression. Thus for him, forms express a physical character only because we possess a human body, clearly an anthropomorphic view, which basically means that we transfer our own form into the objects we perceive through our own bodily organization. For example, if a building produces in us a sense of unease in our body, it's because it disturbs our body's sense of balance. This is a strategy that was used, uh, for example, in the 20th century by the architect Daniel Liebskind on his design for the Jewish Museum, which had this specific uh, purpose of expressing feelings of disorientation, uh, disturbance and um, disquietude. So please take a look at figures 7.1 and 7.2. We made a jump to this in 20th century, but uh, it's important to also to make these parallels through history because obviously um, Daniel Lipskind uh, doing this uh, project for the Jewish uh, Museum was also very aware of, of uh, the design of the, of the building and the design of the exhibition uh, 
um, and how the sensitivity of this uh, of this uh, topic required um, required a certain disposition from uh, to create a certain disposition in the in the visitor. So here you have some examples examples of the corridors which give this feeling of disorientation and also this uh, path where one has to cross walking uh, in all these uh, metal uh, faces which of course is a, a disturbing experience which which has this intention of bringing bringing to memory um, the horrors of the holocaust so Wolfen would subscribe Semper's view of architecture as the result of a conflict between matter and force of form, formcraft, an energetic animation of the masses. So these masses would be animated by our moods, expressing the emotions that come from our own embodied condition. As Vicher relates architecture to the concepts of regularity, symmetry, proportion and harmony, Wolflin reduces architecture's expressive elements to proportionality, horizontality, verticality and ornament. The question of ornament was of particular, particular importance, for example, in the case of Art Nouveau. For Wolflin, ornament was the expression of the excessive force in form, responsible for experiencing architecture with every muscle in one's body, a view which was shared by Henri van der Velde, one of the architects at the time, following closely the Einfühlung theory. Uh, please take a look at figures 7.3 and 7.4, where you have the interior of a dining room with decorative wall panels. Um, and this is a project from uh, Henri van der Velde from 1894. Um, and figure 7.4 has Henri van der Velde's uh, design for a reception uh, dress for, for a lady. So Henri van der Velde was very interested in this idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, of the total artwork. And he would also be heavily criticized because he also took this idea perhaps a little bit too far. And there is a very famous caricature. We will have it further, further in the text, a caricature uh, of an interior by van der Velde in which everything is uh, matching exactly the aesthetic including his wife which is also wearing this kind of uh, gear this kind of attire which had to match had to match the aesthetic and had to had to match this um, uh, this ideal so van der Velde would adopt uh, the empathy theory for the creation of his new style of a new style which advocated the avoidance of direct historical references in order to ban banality and cheap meaningless reproduction of objects from the people's minds he managed to take this concept very far being many of his works the best examples of the ideas of the gesamtkunstwerk or the total artwork and would later be directly attacked by uh, architects such as Adolf Loos for his appraisal of ornament. Van der Velde was also influenced by the philosopher Lips, who in turn would also be interested in Vicher's uh, concept of empathy as aesthetic uh, sympathy. Lips was greatly admired by Freud for his support on the theory of the unconscious and would later in his life become a discipline of Husserl the founder of phenomenology or the study of essences, which we will discuss uh, further uh, in one of our classes. Besides the question of empathy, which Wolfram, uh, according to Malgrave, seems to have lost interest by the end of his uh, thesis, we risk supposing that perhaps it was due to lack of uh, scientific means to justify empirically the theories uh, he had so that he could prove with data, uh, his, um, his hypothesis. His attention was also dedicated to the question of architectural styles and how they can be read as a direct translation into form of the collective attitude and movement of people. This would explain why every period has a characteristic style and therefore form could be read as an expression of a certain mood of the time. By the same time, in 1886, 
Gola, who was a professor of architecture at the Stuttgart Polytechnicum, wrote an essay called What is the cause of perpetual style change in architecture? in which he excludes the questions of style or symbolic meaning and focuses primarily in the faculty of imagination as the main source for the aesthetic appreciation of architecture, therefore as a psychological act and discarding current theories on the role of physiology and corporeality in the experience of emotions. According to Mulgrave, Gola defined architectural experience as an inherently pleasurable, meaningless play of lines or of light and shade. Regarding the question of style, already approached by Semper, Gola defines it as the unconscious mental cause of the pleasure that we take in that form, that is generated in a collective memory image, which lasts as long as the individuals in this particular culture or time in history find pleasure in. Of course, this leads inevitably to a point of saturation in which the style finds finds itself exhausted as the minds of the context had already gotten bored with it. The spectators and the architects don't find any more pleasure in the same old forms and it is up for the architects to create new solutions which usually lead to excess and to a baroque state of the style. Of course, Now we think again of the Art Nouveau and its excessive use of ornament. Goller himself, perhaps predicting a necessity for another change of style in architecture, affirms that during this process of formal oversaturation, what he calls the law of jading or ermudung, the architect's last alternative is to simplify greatly the vocabulary and offer entirely new forms in order to generate a new memory image, which will then undergo a similar dialectic process of change, generally cyclical. We have already referred to Henri van Velde and to Adolf Loos' open attack to his work. Loos would describe the appalling ornamental style of uh, van Velde, starting from the architecture to the furniture decoration, and even to the dressing and accessorizing of his wife, all to match the style of the house. Luz, uh, so we can see uh, here, a parody of uh, Van de Velde's designs from the Lustige Blätter from Berlin, and it's called Van de, Van de Blöde. <laughs> and please take a look at figure 7.5. And this is a very funny, it's a very funny uh, cartoon, which really um, (laughs) explores this uh, idea of uh, movement and of uh, Riven de Velde's extremely organic Art Nouveau uh, uh, design. And there's a very funny, uh, very funny detail. I don't know if you can see it here in the camera. I think you can. Here. This is a baby's uh, crib and the baby is shouting in the middle of this excessive um, Art Nouveau, uh, Art Nouveau uh, environment. So Loos, Adolf Loos, had cut his ties with the Viennese secession, drawing parallels on primitive forms of ornamentation, such as tattoos, and making connections with them and the tendency for crime or social deviation. The comparison is transported to the field of architecture and Loos's work is defi- defined by a set of organicist principles which come closer to the classical vocabulary of architecture such as purity of form and specially truth to the material but assembled through a new spatial concept, the Raumplan, and the absence of excessive ornament. This doesn't mean that Loos was in favor of an extreme purism that later, for example, Le Corbusier would uh, promote. Loos's approach to organicism was meant by the use of refined and even luxurious materials such as marble stone, exotic woods and the finest leathers. Loos collected them along silver pieces and other fine goods. Loos found that the simplicity and truth to the material would serve as decoration by itself without creating too much visual noise. Loos was also particularly interested in the spatial qualities of architecture 
treating space as a material in itself and defining the design's configuration not through plans, sections or facades, but through a spatial continuity between the rooms, which is given by a cubic treatment of the space itself. For laws, there are no rooms or floors, but only space and the interconnections that this has with all the building elements to have a coherent reading of the design as a whole. Here we find, um, just before we continue with the text, please take a look at figure 7.6, where you see an um, image of the interior of the American bar in Vienna by uh, Adolf, Adolf Loos, uh, where you see um, where you see exactly the use of the use of the materials and um, loses more um, a com complete uh, completely away from this aesthetic of the Art Nouveau so there's no use of the of the curve and of the whiplash uh, motive um, it's a uh, very clear uh, orthogonal uh, geometry um, and no ornament in the sense of decoration which does not mean that the space and the treatment of the space does not have an ornamental quality. But the ornamental quality comes from, from this um, honesty and truth to the properties of the material um, of the materials themselves. So uh, for Loses, it was really important to choose these, materia these materials, precious materials that really had by themselves this uh, aesthetic quality. And for example, you see here the interior of the Lowe's bar um, that uh, there is also the use of, of a mirror where the bar is very very small so he used this uh, perspective uh, um, a, a kind of pers uh, illusion uh, repl replication of the space for, because of the use of the mirror um, around um, uh, I show you here in the image, it's better than to describe it just verbally. So the space is replicated by the use of mirrors. And, and this is an op optical trick. Of course, when one visits the space, uh, in terms of uh, corporeality, uh, it's not a pleasant experience to visit the laws, uh, to visit the American bar if there's too many people inside, because it's really, really small. Uh, there's not much air, there's, there's not much space for too many people, although visually it does look much more spacious than, than, it, actually, than it actually is. Um, so in, in the work of Adolf Loos, uh, Loos, it's also easy to find references to the work of uh, Alberti, who was also interested in this conson consonance. Uh, between between the parts, but also uh, Laws was very interested in making these references to classical architecture. Although Laws opted for designs with a rationalized and rather stripped uh, appearance, um, and especially a new spatial uh, vocabulary with the use of uh, layered space. So it's still possible to trace some connections uh, with the architecture of, of uh, other members of the Viennese uh, secession. So this this was a group that Laws was uh, fairly related to, although he, he was uh, independent. And for example, um, the work of Jose Plecznik, uh, Slovenian uh, architect, also had some some connections with the work of Adolf Loos. Uh, Plecznik would have been, uh, was responsible for much of the architectural identity of the city of Ljubljana in Slovenia and was commissioned for the renovation of the castle of Prague um, in 1920. So although he was a member of the secession, uh, Plechnik introduced abstracted forms in the classical repertoire of his uh, architecture and he was one of the main influences on the development of the polygonal style of, of later uh, Czech cubism, which was a very specific case in the history of architecture that developed between the First and the Second World Wars. So 
as a reference please take a look at image uh, 7.8 and 7.9 where you have uh, an image uh, of, of um, a church of Ple Plechnik uh, in Prague uh, which uses this um, geometry of, of, of the diamond and uh, a picture of uh, Josef uh, George Hall I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this Czech name correctly um, which is a, a residential building in Prague in the Czech cubist style so you can see here the references and not as a completely far uh, coincidence we, we are not talking about the Czech cubism in this case but I just make I just make a parallel here because uh, Josef Chochol and also Pavel uh, Janak who was the theoretician of the um, architecture uh, Czech, uh, Czech movement, uh, Czech cubist architecture. Um, they were also very interested in the work of Henri van Velde and his uh, ideas on aesthetic, although they did not follow the Art Nouveau, but they were influenced by the empathy theories and they were influenced by the work of uh, Wicher, Wolflin, and uh, and lips so they were very interested in psychology and, and in perception um, so Czech cubism was really a very uh, particular um, fusion of the ideas of uh, cubism uh, some influences also of uh, German and German aesthetics local um, traditions as so local historical uh, traditions in architecture um, and an interpretation of Rudolf Steiner's and uh, Albert Einstein's uh, ideas on, on movement. So Czech cubism is really something uh, very interesting, just as a parallel. So it is possible to conclude that even within the secession, there were already signs of saturation of the Art, nou Art Nouveau style. Also, Adolf Loos pointed out the question of ornament was indeed a corporeal problem, since besides its symbolic interpretations, it was also related to the positivist approach to the body as a material, which can only be rendered efficient and decent through hard discipline. Ornament and uh, Adolf Loos was uh, is a. Um, is a, a, a figure with a lot of contradictions for example ornament uh, and crime is a text that has a lot, shows a lot of uh, racial uh, prejudices and Loos himself was uh, had uh, trouble with the law he was accused of being of being a pedophile for example so there, there are many things about the character of Adolf Loos that um, that also are revealed in this text, ornamented crime, but still it, it, it was a uh, widely, widely acclaimed uh, text uh, for a long time and um, it really had a very strong influence in the development of the ideas of uh, modern architecture. But ornament and crime is definitely a positivist uh, text. And it's full of corporeal examples. For example, uh, Adolf Loos uses them in a very moralist uh, tone to show that for him, these questions of ornament uh, was not only a matter of aesthetics, but mostly of ethics. So for Adolf Loos, ornament uh, was related to primitive cultures, uh, to uh, uh, and primitive cultures, of course, would be related to less intelligent, criminal, uh, potentially dangerous, uh, bringing disease, so very positivist. For Adolf Loos, modern men should rely on or should not re should rely on um, ornament to expose his individuality, but ornament in this sense of the purity of the material itself. As simplicity, though this kind of simplicity showed that he was spiritually superior. So that was his uh, theory. And from the beginning of the text, we understand that Adolf Loos was directly influenced by Darwinism, 
at least in one what concerns the evolution of the human being in terms of cult culture and personal maturity. For Adolf Loos, the primitive man had to rely on ornament to fill his time as a source of joy. Taking it away from him would be as equal as telling him there was no God to put his faith into. Instead, modern man didn't need any of this, being only a waste of time and energy. Loos defended that this childish behavior was a sign of degeneracy and that industrial society shouldn't allow mankind to waste time with this primitive kind of work, leaving their minds free to indulge in higher subjects. But in fact, Laws had been even more influenced by American construction logic and rationalization that he was exposed to during his visits to New York and Chicago. So Adolf Loos has had visited the United States and he was so impressed, for example, by the work of um, by the, by the work of uh, Sullivan uh, and also by uh, the American um, efficient way of, of building and, and by this uh, industrialization. So Sullivan's work made such a strong impression that Adolf Loos immediately transposed the values of scientific management for architecture and for life itself, defending a strict abidance to the laws of the market. Following this logic, even meals should be simple and done as quick and efficiently as possible without the burden of hours of work. The same should be applied to the fabrication of objects, which shouldn't be ornamental at all, representing only a waste of vital energy to the workers. Sullivan was already largely influenced by a certain logic of the market, which considered construction sites as assembly lines and therefore, workers' actions were already coordinated in such a manner to avoid the waste of time and resources. The new large buildings of Chicago were proof that the rationalization of the design would be transferred directly into the economic efficiency of the investment, saving both time and money. This logic of work was characteristic of Taylorism, a set of philosophical principles which had the purpose to manage factory workers' production through scientific management. Naturally, this was meant with a logic of profit, and so the notion of standardization also came to being. It was necessary to reduce the diversity of design options in order to optimize the production process as much as possible, saving time and resources. Regarding the labor condition, this also meant that there would be no need for special skills or craftsmanship since each member of the assembly line was generally confined to a single task all day every day of his work time at the factory. This could be something as simple as screwing the heads of a doll, a seemingly repeated action which led to both tedium and specific injuries related to the overstrain of the body in a single task for a long time and also to a sense of alienation, as the kind of work itself didn't allow any kind of interaction or creative output. Taylorism wasn't the only set of ideas with the purpose of implementing efficiency in production line. In fact, there were competitor theories such as Fordism, which applied similar principles to the evaluation of efficiency, including time and movement studies. So, for uh, some images of the assembly line, please take a look at figures 7.12, 7.13, where you have the assembly line by um, in the factory of Henry Ford, so for the automobile uh, industry. And figure 7.14, it's uh, from Gilbreth um, efficiency studies. So you can see how these studies were done using uh, long exposure photography to analyze the movements of, of the people in order to optimize to optimize their efficiency and make them make them work there was a quote by Gilbreth uh, mentioning that uh, in this way we can train a worker to be able to be as efficient as a, as a monkey so the whole idea that <laughs> that the human body could be conditioned to do these tasks in series, this series of tasks, and how can we make it to faster and faster and faster and 
waste less and less and less time so obviously no joy no no uh, emotional connection with the task just doing 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 these studies were particularly important since uh, it didn't take much time to realize that workers efficiency and productivity levels also depended on factors such as the levels of strain the speed of other colleagues in the production possibilities to take breaks or not in the end the major difference between taylorism and fordism specifically was that the second already relied on strategies of incentive to make workers feel that their actions were part of concrete goals which they would eventually also enjoy in taking part mass production in such an assembly such assembly lines would allow a worker to get one of the products himself so it was this idea with taylorism that the people working in the factory felt that they were producing something they were producing these cars and one day they would be able to buy one of those cars also themselves so by being so connected with the construction uh, with the, of this of this uh, machine um, they felt that they were shaping society somehow because people would be using these cars and due to uh, um, for um, Ford's uh, uh, approach to to um, to the car industry uh, production um, it was also this narrative that the workers of this factory one day could, could also own a Ford which was a car for, for the people this had double advantages for the producer who could extend the range of clients also for for the workers they could also become potential clients and second it would give the workers this rewarding feeling that they belonged to a certain group and shared the same values so it was also the beginning of a company company or, or corporate culture in a way the traditional spirit of the craftsman work in guilds was somehow transported to the production line the human factor was mostly illusory as knowledge in the assembly lines wasn't transmitted from master to apprentice but registered also through mechanical means to be served in the optimization process over and over again photography had taken a major part in this process as it allowed the study of the motions of the workers in detail at different times of their performance the purpose was to reduce inefficient movement to make the workers concentrate only in the movements strictly necessary to the accomplishment of the task at hand, also making the monitoring of their performance easier, making it possible to correct assembly flaws and optimize results as much as possible. Video was also used, as the end of the 19th century also brought along the expansion of the moving image, which would be fundamental shifting in shifting the perception of space and time in the next century. The mechanistic view of the human body and of course the technological developments brought by standardization and the optimization of the assembly line allowed for another jump which made time run even faster than at the beginning of the 20th century. The next years would bring the death of the material body of labor and the birth of the virtual body which would make it appear omnipresent and immortal. At the same time philosophy was also starting to address the question of essences and the beginning years of the 20th century saw the birth of phenomenology, a discipline dedicated to the study of modes of consciousness as the result from embodied experience, pinning down the importance of new concepts such as empathy and intersubjectivity in the psychological constitution of humankind. Husserl would be the first to approach this problem, but soon his disciples such as uh, Edith Stein, who dedicated her thesis to the topic of empathy, would spread it through Europe, and especially Germany, where the matter had already been addressed, as we mentioned before, in the aesthetical field. And so this was lesson number seven. We spoke a lot about empathy and about aesthetics, and also we, we went through um, some cases in architecture history and how how these theories were expressed in building. We also saw 
these two very two uh, very different uh, positions regarding ornament, ornament. For example, the uh, Rival de Verde and his uh, architecture of the Art Nouveau, and then Adolf Loos um, with his uh, round plan, and also of course uh, his statements with uh, positivist statements of uh, ornament and crime. And we will continue with the next lesson. Thank you.